Okay. So we'll, we'll get kicked off now. Can everybody hear me okay on the microphone? We're a small group, so it doesn't really matter too much. But thank you for joining us today. I know it's after lunch, and I know it's day two of Linux Fest Northwest, so hopefully you'll find this uh, engaging and informative session. So my name's Ed Cable, and I'm going to talk about, yeah. I don't think you have to, I don't think it's actually coming through the speaker, so. No, oh, it's, okay. it's just for the video. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so it's all just for, the, okay. Don't have to worry about that. All right. Oh, good, good. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. So I'm going to talk about our experiences uh, with Google Summer of Code as the org administrator for the MIFOS initiative and how we try and make the internship, which is only summer long, have both an impact as well as a experience for the student be endless. So just this is a little bit of a rundown of what I'm hoping to cover today. So we'll just go over you know, the goals of what we want to accomplish, a little bit about myself, a little bit about the MIFOS initiative, and then I'll talk about our history of participation in Google Summer of Code, as well as the impact it's had on our organization. And then I'll look at our recipe for success and how we've been able to transform our interns into long-term contributors. And then I'll talk a little bit about some challenges and then close with some takeaways and then have hopefully some time at the end for any questions you all might have. And so first off, just wanted to you know set the stage of what hoping to accomplish. So hopefully this is going to be a valuable session for everybody in the room whether you're a student or whether you might be an organization that is taking on interns for your project. And so for organizations, you know, this doesn't apply just to Google Summer of Code, but the lessons I hope to impart on you apply to whatever type of internship program you might work on. And then for the students or interns in the room, you know, this can help you get the most out of any internship or participation in any open source project in general and help you hopefully grow professionally and also have a, a lasting impact on the organization you're working with. And I know we've got a small group in the room right now, but who in the room is like either a student or intern? Okay, a few people, so about half. And then who in the room would be an organization that's participated in Google Summer of Code before? Okay, we've got two, and then are there anybody in the room that's representing an organization that is looking to participate in Summer of Code or some type of internship project? Okay, well, good. So. Yeah, and then what's your two guys, what's your background, so? My background, um, mechanical designer, electrical designer, and teacher. Okay, great. So teacher and then yourself, sir? Mm, work at Redfin. Okay, so at the university. Okay, great. Directly related with, uh, with, with the community. So we have interns. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to talk a little bit my, about myself first. So I think this is my fourth Linux Fast Northwest right now. And I used to call Washington home, but I now reside in far northern California where we have these big trees here, the redwoods, so it's a nice place to, to live. So. And so here's a little bit about myself, both at a professional and a personal level. So professionally, you know, my full career has been with, with MIFO, so in turn with the open source community. And I think my personal journey with HFOS is, or humanitarian free and open source software, is a pretty valuable story in and of, of itself of the types of impact you can have in open source without being a software developer, because I'm not a developer. I've maybe made one pull request in my life and haven't written many lines of code, but I've been involved on the business and administrative side of our project for a little more than a, a decade now. So I studied marketing and management at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania and then got really intrigued with social entrepreneurship. And luckily when I graduated in 2006, I was able to find an internship a short while later at the Green Foundation in Seattle. And my first project with Mifos was to work on building out like a web portal for the project as it had just launched the first version of its software and wanted to try and grow the community. And so luckily after the internship, I was able to stay on in a marketing coordinator role. And then I moved into a community manager role. And at that time, that's where I interacted with a number of like the local partners and local volunteers from our community and really saw the potential it had to grow. And then in 2011, the project hit some hard times within Grameen, and we all got laid off. But luckily, since it was an open source project, you know, you could, someone could take the code over and keep things moving along. So my colleague and I, we took over the community. We set up a separate 501c3 nonprofit, got our previous funder on board, and then set on launching a new strategy to really focus in on the community. And so over the past several years, I've then been leading our community. And recently, we spun out a separate company, and I, I took the helm of the nonprofit over as the president of the MIFOS initiative. And I'll talk a little bit more about what MIFOS actually does, 
but I've been able to go from an intern to CEO of the Mythos community, and it's been an incredible journey seeing what open source can do for poverty alleviation. And then at a personal level, I'll just play this little video here. So when I'm not, yeah, when I'm not guiding our community, my wife and I, we take care of a four-year-old foster child, and then we also are Airbnb hosts. We've hosted more than 800 people in our home in Northern California, and then we also have a big menagerie of animals. So we have two rescue dogs, Woody and Petunia. We've got a flock of chickens, a pair of peacocks, uh, three bunnies, and a couple goats. And then this is an example of sometimes the traffic I face in my morning commute when I'm going back from dropping our foster kid off back to my home office. But it's been neat for me to be able to you know, work remotely and have such a big impact on our global community just from my home in Northern California. So just a little bit about Mifos now. So the Mifos Initiative is an award-winning, free and open source nonprofit software project focused on ending poverty one line of code at a time. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we do. So. so our focus is on providing access to technology-enabled financial inclusion across the world. And you might wonder, you know, what is financial inclusion? And so you probably might be familiar with microfinance as Mohammed Yunus, he received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2006 for his efforts in pioneering microfinance at the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. And you might also recognize the name Kiva, which really made microfinance a household and mainstream brand. But financial inclusion, it really goes beyond just microcredit and providing access to these loans. It also means access to a full range of financial services to help these families lift themselves out of poverty. So having a safe place to save money, having a place to manage risk, having access to low cost and affordable payments. And so technology not only makes the delivery of these services more efficient, but it also allows them to connect to innovative services like mobile money, mobile banking apps, and what we like to call financial inclusion 2.0, or the fast, low cost, mobile delivery of digital financial services to the poor. And so as the industry has evolved from microfinance to financial inclusion and digital financial services, Mifos in various forms has presided over a number of evolutions of our software to help the, soft, the sector evolve itself. And so first off, as I mentioned earlier, as a project of Grameen Foundation where we originated, we launched the world's first open source web-based MIS, or Management Information System for Grameen Style Joint Liability Group Lending. And then in 2011, after my colleague and I spun the project out, we launched Mifos X, or what we now call Apache Finrac, which at the time was the world's first open source API-driven core banking platform for financial inclusion. And what we've been working on the past couple years is the launch of Apache Finrac CN, which is a cloud-native microservices-oriented application framework for digital financial services. And throughout Summer of Code, our interns have had a big impact on advancing each generation of these technologies. So right here is just like a brief look at the stack that we have. So typically, most of our users right now are still traditional financial institutions that need a system to run their back office. So we provide both the platform as well as a web app and then now the application framework. And then we also provide client-facing applications, including an AngularJS web-based uh, online banking app as well as a mobile banking app for clients, a mobile wallet app for clients, and a mobile application for, for field officers. And so most yeah, most of the usage, we have some adoption in Europe and a little bit in North America, but primarily in developing countries right now. So. Do you have an example? Uh, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about some examples coming up. So, But really, we aim to not only provide a solution that users can use out of the box, but also provide the starting dough or building blocks to build whatever type of solutions are needed. And so this like touches on where most of our adoption is, sir. So across the world, we've got a network of more than 120 partners, and they're reaching a little more than 300 financial institutions right now that collectively serve about 8 million clients. And most of these, as I said earlier, are traditional brick-and-mortar financial institutions. But more recently, we've seen a lot more fintech innovation on our platform, and that's why we've been moving towards more of the digital financial services innovation. So around the world, we have companies that are using our open source backend to power mobile wallets, digital credit solutions, agent banking solutions, et cetera. And hopefully with a lot of the 
work, our Google Summer of Code interns will see more of this DFS or digital financial service innovation. And so guiding all of this is our global community. This is from a couple years ago at one of our global summits. There's a number of our interns in the picture there. And so now that you've seen both our community and you've seen our tech stack, you know, I really want to just take it back to what really motivates and guides us each day. And so our shared vision that guides our project is 3 billion Maries. Uh, this is Marie Claire. She was a borrower in Rwanda that one of our former uh, project leads came across when he was working on the Village Phone project. And she really had her life transformed by access to microcredit. She had to persevere through the loss of two husbands and then was able to take out loans to build a house for her family, send her children to school. And it's her you know, personal story that she was able to overcome her tragedies that guides us uh, each day for our project. We really try and connect that social mission to our intern programs to really let the students know how much impact they're having and then they're able to fight poverty with financial inclusion, which is one of our taglines. So for those of you who don't know, I'll just talk a little bit about Summer of Code. But as I said earlier, the same techniques and practices we've used for GSOC can be applied and extended to whatever type of internship or outreach program you're, you're working on. So Google Summer of Code is now in its 13th year. And basically, you know, each year Google selects around 200 open source projects, give or take a couple dozen each year. And then these are the organizations that serve as the mentoring orgs that provide both mentors as well as projects for the students to work on. And Google provides a stipend for the summer for the student that works on the project. So the organizations post a list of ideas that they want students to work on. Students apply for these ideas. Based on those applications, the organizations get assigned slots. And then based on the slots the organizations get, they select their students. And then Summer of Code begins. So this is a little timeline of the participation of the MIFOS initiative in Summer of Code. So this only shows five years of participation. We actually participated for two years prior to this when we were within Grameen Foundation. But to fit everything on the slide, I just put uh, these five years. But 2009 was the first official year that we participated. And then this also, 2013 was also the first year I myself was the org admin. But we've been able to really grow the part level of participation as well as the impact we've had through Google Summer of Code. So we started with two interns in 2009 or four in 2013 and have grown to 13, which we recently just accepted for this year's Summer of Code. And over the years, we've really been able to not only have a big impact throughout the summer, but turn these contributors into long-term members of the community that have made countless impacts that I'm going to touch on today. So I think looking at the numbers here, like I've tried to denote which ones have stuck around after Summer of Code. So the little green circle means they were still continuing to make contributions to the community after the summer. And then the blue circle means they became a mentor for us for Google Coding, which is Google's program to educate high schoolers on open source. And then the orange circle means they also were able to be a future Google Summer of Code mentor for us. So I think if you count the numbers through 2013 to 2017, we were able to retain about two-thirds of our students as long-term members of the community. And I'll talk about more about why that's so valuable for us. So. And first off, he's not in the room today, but I wanted to thank Adam Monson, who I always see at Linux Fest Northwest, as he was the, the guy who put together our first application for Summer of Code in 2009 and the practices and processes he put in place, we still continue to follow those each year and continue to refine them as we move along. And so before we look at what our recipe for success has been, I want to talk a little bit about the impact Google Summer of Code has had on our organization. And so we're a relatively small open source project as well as nonprofit, and our focus is pretty niche. So having the ability to participate in Google Summer Code has been really impactful for us for a number of different reasons. And it's been even more impactful as of late as we moved away from having any uh, paid developers directly within our nonprofit. So we've become really reliant upon Summer of Code for the, the lifeblood it really provides to our project. But it helps us not only just develop new innovation during the summer, it allows us to maintain the core applications after the summer but it really allows us to attract new contributors and create a virtuous cycle of organic growth that continues to pay dividends for the project long into the future and really is truly an endless summer of code. So first off, in the summer, we do get valuable code each summer. 
So all of our projects that we select and look for students for are driven by user needs, so we hope they'll have immediate impact. And so I'll go through a few screenshots of just some of the projects that have been worked on recently. But we've had students work on both the core platform as well as the web app. So here there's a, just the redesign of the web app that one of our students worked on last summer. And then one of our students at the platform level integrated in a data import tool into the project. We also had a student work on two-factor authentication last year and also a project to integrate with credit bureaus in India and Africa. And then recently we've really focused most of our Summer of Codes interns on applications on top of the platform. So we have a mobile field app for the field officers so they can go out into the field and do all their operations and collect data. And this is built on Android. So our Summer of Code intern in 2013 built from scratch the first version of this application. And then each subsequent year we've had students continue to work on that. So this year we'll have one student working on it and it'll be version 5.0 of the application. Last summer we also had a student in India work on the mobile wallet framework that I talked about before. So we not only built the mobile wallet framework in Android, but he also built two proof of concept apps. And one of them here represented is linked with the UPI APIs in India to allow an omni-channel payment solution there. And then this is a little GIF of the mobile banking app that our students worked on the past two years and we'll have a student working on this year. But it allows a client to interact directly with their accounts and then do transfers amongst their savings, loan repayments, and we're going to connect it with the mobile money platform this year so they can send money externally as well. What, what were people using before they had this? So primarily they were either using, like some were still using Excel or paper-based systems, but some you know, were using local homegrown systems that weren't robust enough, and many also were using very expensive like core banking systems that weren't really tailored and designed for the microfinance processes. So. so a second major point of impact for Google Summer of Code is really the education and introduction to open source that it enables. So this is one of our previous interns, Nikhil. And this quote you can read here, but it was from a blog post that he wrote talking about how open source has been a critical part of his journey, not only as a software engineer, but also as a person. And so he, after completing his Summer of Code internships, uh, started working remotely for one of our partners in Sierra Leone, and then he recently got a job with Barclays that he's going to move on to soon. But Summer of Code has been a vital part of his career development. He was an intern for Mifos one year, and then he also interned through GSOC for Apache Finneract. And then not only does it introduce students to open source, but it really is a jump start to their long-term career paths as software developers. I'll talk a little more in depth about some of the trajectory that our students have gone on, but these are just a few of the companies that our past students are now working at. And most of our students are still in university, but the ones that have graduated, these are some of the companies they're at right now. And then Summer of Code really also allows the mentors in our community to, to give back to the the open source community and give back to the world at large. So this is one of our mentors, Michael Vorberger, who's based in Switzerland. And I think this was a student who was from Germany, and they met up, I think, at a DevOps conference there. But serving as a mentor is really an efficient way to allow our skilled volunteers, who are typically uh, you know, volunteers and have a full-time day job, to allow themselves to give back in a meaningful way without having to spend you know, hours and hours of their time. And so it allows them to pass the torch on to a new generation of contributors. And so we find that as a really happy medium to engage these senior individuals to help bring on the new contributors of the future. And then not only do like our students provide a valuable impact over the summer, but they really do move on to become like the bedrock and foundation of our community. And so I'll talk about it in more depth a little bit later on. But many of the interns that I talked about on the slide before, they've gone on to become the core maintainers of our platform and the various apps. And as we've moved away from having any paid developers on staff, this has been vital for us. And frankly, if we didn't have these Summer of Code interns and didn't have them sticking around, our project probably wouldn't be here today. So that's really been critical for us to enable them to be long-term contributors as they not only you know, are contributors, but they're also the biggest evangelists of the project as well. And so our students really are the torch bearers for our project, and they really help to pass on the torch to the next generation of contributors. So we've found that our interns are some of the most loyal and passionate members of the community. They're the ones who want to participate in Google Summer of Code again. They're the ones who want to act as Google Code and mentors. They're the ones who 
go out to their local universities, go out to their high schools to talk about the project. So it's also this fact that they care so much about evangelizing the project. They're so passionate about it that they want to pass the torch on to the next generation. And then lastly, this little quote here from Michael helps to summarize nicely uh, the impact Summer of Code has. So I'll just read it out in case it can be heard on the recording too. But just how amazing is it that Google Summer of Code gets us four students from Germany, China, Sri Lanka, and India, coached by mentors from India, Ghana, and Switzerland to collaborate purely in cyberspace together on adding features to a microfinance platform. The world truly is flat. So this was after the first year we participated in the Summer of Code as an independent organization, and it really helps to illustrate just how valuable Summer of Code can be in connecting individuals across the world. And next, I'm going to talk about how you know, we've been successful in retaining our contributors. So it really begins with having a strong and welcoming culture that's both passionate of our social mission and also empathetic and patient to work with new contributors. You also have to have projects that are impactful as well as challenging and appealing to the students. And lastly, you need to have strong processes in place and really be demanding of what you're expecting from the students. So now that you've seen the impact GSOC can have, I want to talk a little bit about how you can put in practice a program for your own organization. So GSOC really begins first off with planning. So planning essentially begins pretty much after the previous year's GSOC wraps up. And so we really start out by trying to seek out in our community who wants to be a mentor. And so we're seeking out individuals who are patient, they're empathetic, they're passionate, and they can really communicate well and are eager about onboarding new contributors. And then next, we also have to generate a list of ideas. We want these to be driven by user need. We want them to be appealing to students. We want them to be of you know, sufficient duration that you could work on them for a summer. And so sometimes you know, it's modifications to the core. Sometimes it's evolving the applications we have. And then this year, we're working on some innovative, nice-to-have projects like a chat bot, also doing stuff, some stuff around machine learning. But we do want to try and have like, projects that will deliver an impact to the the project itself, but also challenge the student. And so once you've got this group of committed mentors, you have a solid list of ideas fleshed out on your wiki, and you've documented the processes you'll keep in place to both interact with students as well as retain your mentors. Next, it's time to submit your application. And this usually occurs in about January, February. Sometimes it's earlier, sometimes it's later. But hopefully when you're fortunate enough to get this email that says you've been selected as a mentoring organization, that's when Google Summer of Code truly begins. And so for students that are looking to participate in Summer of Code, they literally have hundreds of different projects and thousands of ideas that they could select from that they'd like to apply for. So it is critical once the application window opens that you begin to promote your organization. You have your ideas page on the Summer of Code dashboard but you also need to go beyond that to try and promote your, your organization and the projects you have. So we typically always have like a welcome blog post that talks about each of the projects, has a number of videos, and talks about what we accomplished over the previous years. And then some of our students go out to the universities in person and have sessions and lead them through that. We typically do an AMA session and webinar to answer any questions students have. And then some of our students have also participated in other organizations when they've had uh, roundtables to talk about best practices for open source. But for us, we really want to emphasize the importance of our social mission, the fintech stack that's interesting that we have to work on, as well as the long-term impact that they're going to have. And so we're really trying to hone it in with the tagline, end poverty, one line of code at a time. And so for our students, we really look at their overall body of work. We want them to have a solid application with a detailed project plan. And then on that application, we always ask them key questions. We want to ensure that they don't have any other commitments because Summer of Code is a full-time job and we can't have them you know, doing another internship or another full-time job. We also want to make sure they're motivated by our social mission. And we also really want to see where they are long-term, where they see themselves long-term in our community. And then there's two areas that I'm going to hone in on here in our evaluation process. The first off is around community engagement, and then the second is around their long-term potential in the project. And then after we've evaluated all the students and shortlisted some, we typically do two Skype interviews to really make sure they're a good fit, assess their technical skills, and then see how motivated they are by the mission of our project. 
And to, on the evaluation side, to assess the long-term fit, you know, we really are seeking, uh, sorry, it's cut off there a bit, but seeking passion and potential. So sometimes that might mean selecting a student that isn't as strong skill-wise, that doesn't have as much experience. But if we think they have a lot of potential, they're really driven by the mission, we'd probably select them because we're looking for students that will not only excel during the summer, but stick around beyond that. And then we ask those questions, we look at their, about their interactions with the community, and we judge from that. And then engagement for us is also really critical. So we ensure that each student has at least one pool request during the application period. And this year, I think some of our students had like dozens of pool requests during the application period. But if you haven't made a pool request, we don't consider your application complete. And for us, it allows us to not only see their code level skills, but also demonstrate their ability to communicate, collaborate with the community, and follow our guidelines and use GitHub and whatnot. So that, in a nutshell, is how we do the evaluation process. And so once Google has allocated you a number of slots that you get, you then select your students, they finalize their project plans, and then the bonding and coding period is ready to begin. So now I'm going to talk about what we do during Summer of Code to both make our students successful but also keep them around for the long haul. So first off, I want to just define what we think of and look for as success. And a little bit is cut off, so I'll read that there. But first off, we want, to, we want and try to have the student be successful in completing the project. So we don't want it to be of too long of a duration. We don't want it to be too simple. We want it to be challenging, and we want them to learn and grow from it. But we also want them to feel like they've made an impact on our social mission. And then the last point that's cut off there is just being a feel like that they're a part of an organization and can know like, what their long-term contributions can be. And so I want to also just hone in on you know, the importance of belonging here. And I think John O'Bacon's quote here really helps to bring that home. And for interns who are brand new to our community, having that sense of belonging is ever more critical for them. So from the onset, we really want to foster this sense of belonging and make them feel immediately that they're a part of the community, not only for the summer, but well beyond. So hopefully you had a chance to read that quote. And then secondly, beyond just making them feel like they belong in our community, we also want them to have a sense of purpose and really know like, where they can go into the future. So this is something that came up at the Mentor Summit about trying to like, publish like, a roadmap or a personal growth plan of sorts to really show where in the organization the student fits in so they know how they fit into the bigger picture beyond just the summer itself. And so during Summer of Code, just in terms of some of the nitty-gritty of making them be successful in the project, I'll get back to how we foster the sense of belonging and how we give them a long-term role a little bit later. But in terms of communications, you know, we have a few protocols that we follow strictly. So we have them do daily check-ins via Slack now. We implemented using the GeekBot last summer, and that's been valuable as it sends out the message to them for their check-in questions at the same time each day. And then we can go back and see all those responses all in one place. We also have a Google group for the mentors and interns where they can have discussions, even though most discussions should be on the public mailing list. We also do a weekly hangout just via voice for all of the students and hopefully some of the, the mentors as well. But it gives everybody a chance to connect, share what they're working on, and raise any issues and have students help each other out. And then we also have the mentors do daily and however frequent check-ins they need directly with their students. And then we also want the students to commit early and often. So we had some problems in the past where they're waiting you know, long into the project to make their commit. And then it became really difficult to provide feedback or help them course correct and be successful. So we encourage them to you know, make small commits early and very often. So if we need to help them with a the code, it can be done in a manageable way. And then we also try and make them you know, be a part of the community by having the option to showcase their work. So we have a number of online meetings for our users and developers through the community. So both midterm and at the end of Summer of Code, we have the students showcase their work. And this is a valuable time to allow them to get feedback from other interns, but also to allow the community to provide real-time real feedback. And it also helps the interns see that their projects are having immediate value on the community. And then another big part of helping them feel like they belong and also seeing the value that their work is having and how they can contribute in the future is just to really immerse them directly in the community and not make them feel like an outsider. So at the beginning of Summer of Code, we always have a formal welcome blog post where we introduce the students and what they're working on. 
We also have them introduce themselves via email. And then we also always have them try and be as transparent and on the list as possible through the showcases and other ways. We try and have them be regular participants in our online meetings. And then wherever they can occur, we try and encourage face-to-face -face meetups if they're located nearby members of our community. But we want them to feel like they're an integral part of the community and they're not just an intern there for the summer, but see how they can fit in. And then it really does take a village to help a student be successful. So although we don't want to have, you know, students have external dependencies on other students, like the work that Dilpreet did on the MIFOS mobile or mobile banking app last summer really demonstrated, you know, how it takes the overall team to really deliver on the project. So another intern, just out of his own spare time, uh, Ronick here, he worked on providing some mock-ups to help him roll out the mobile banking app. And then Nazir was one of our core maintainers. He was building out the APIs that were needed for the back end of the app. That's Danila, a volunteer in our community who worked on the user stories for the application. And then on the right-hand side were four of the mentors, uh, Puneet, Rajan, Ishan, and then myself as the, the org admin. But really, you know, we need these teams to work together to have that collaborative spirit, but also to have the redundancy of effort in case, you know, someone doesn't finish something up and then just making sure if there is a dependency on other code in the project, it can be met early on. You have all these interns, but did, did the leads who are doing code reviews? So, so most of those are actual volunteers now. Last year we did have one paid developer guiding the project, but most of the leads are either members of partner organizations that use the software and then contribute back, but more so it's primarily been volunteers who are past interns or members of the community that are doing the, the code reviews and code the leads. Can't, I mean, they can't do a commit that goes into your... No, it, it, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about how, how long it's taken to ship some of the code because we reached a bottleneck at the end of last summer with all the interns and low, low number of maintainers. So. And so we also try and make the students feel like they belong by encouraging them to be very social. So as I said, we do the blog post at the beginning of the summer, or at the beginning of the summer, the, we also do one midterm through the summer, and then at the end we do a couple of posts to summarize what they've worked on, but also to recap what they've done. And then we also encourage our students to write blog posts like Dilpreet did over here, and then make sure we share, showcase it and share that with the rest of our community. And then I want to close on talking about the during. You know, that failure really is an option. And so if you have to fail a student, you shouldn't be afraid or worrisome about doing, in that, doing it. And for me, as an org admin, that's been hard, you know, the couple of times we've had to fail students. And I really have to trust the intuition and the guts of our mentors because they've, you know, even though it's been a hard decision at time, like years later when we've looked back at it, they've always made the right decision. And I think the lesson from that is to, you know, if you're going to fail, like do it earlier on in the project and not delay the inevitable because it, you know, it's more time in the mentors and then the student feels bad when they've contributed work and they get failed. So I wouldn't be afraid to, to fail as it's something that, you know, Google finds is healthy. They want people to be demanding of their interns. Like it looks, you know, it looks odd if you've never failed a student. So just taking Yoda's words here, the greatest teacher, failure is. So we've looked at what we do during Summer of Code, and I think a lot of what's been successful for us is what we do after Summer of Code to keep our students around. And so I want to summarize it with, you know, what I'm saying, the five R's. And I'll talk more about these as I get to each slide. But first off is role. And secondly is recognition. Third is recommendations. Fourth is referrals. And then fifth is rewards. And there might be a, a sixth R that comes up later on too. But this is myself and four of our interns who are, who are at the last Mentor Summit. This was actually my first time being at the, the Mentor Summit, so it was nice to see what it was like finally and connect with all these uh, mentors. Most of them were from India, but one was also coming from Amsterdam. So first off, you know, know your role, as The Rock might say. But really, you know, that focuses on going back to that growth plan and the visual roadmap for the students, you know, letting them know, like, how they can become a part of the community and what their long-term place is in the future. So over the past year and a half, we became a top-level project within Apache. So part of our source code is within Mifos, like most of the front end, the web and mobile apps, but then the back end platform is within Apache. And so any of the students that have contributed at the platform level, once they've done that, they've had good public engagement. We've really worked hard to get them in as committers to the project. So these are six of our uh, committers. We only have, I think, about two dozen committers now, so a quarter of them have all been previous GSOC 
students. And then, as I said earlier, and this gets to your point about the code leads, so now, like most of our core repositories, both the platform as well as the mobile apps, they're all maintained and led by former GSOC interns. So at the platform level, you know, two of our committers, Avik and Nikhil, they're the ones who are doing the maintenance and release management. And then for our web app, two of our previous interns, Gaurav and Mohit, are the ones who've been maintaining it. And then for our field officer app for the staff, Raja and a previous intern and Ishan, a previous intern, they've been the lead maintainers for that. Likewise, Dilpreet and Rajan have been doing that for a mobile banking app, and the same for the other applications here. And so without these individuals stepping up to take these roles, you know, we wouldn't have anybody in the community to be doing this. We wouldn't have ongoing development to these apps. We wouldn't be able to ship out releases to our community. So that's been critical for us. And then we also, you know, let students know that they can become future mentors to the project. So these are all previous GSOC students who have gone on to become mentors for MIFOS. So a lot of them are familiar faces you saw on the previous slides, but we also have Naman, Tarun, uh, Ronak, and Mohit here. And then we also allow them to be mentors for Google Coden. And as I said before, you know, they're really the driving force behind our participation in this project uh, to engage with high school students. So you see most of the same folks who have signed on to be GSOC mentors, but we also have several of our other GSOC students who have gone on to become mentors for Google Coden. And then the next R is recognition. So I think Mr. T puts it best that you better recognize. And so I can't put it any better than that, but there isn't anything more powerful than recognition for our students. So shout outs via social media go a long way. We always try and recognize their contributions or when students are getting together on Facebook. And then each month we also try and recognize a star contributor to the project. So these are just a few of the interns who over the, the years have been recognized as our star contributor. And in the future, one thing that came up uh, during the Mentor Summit as well that we haven't done but we want to start to do is have like an uh, alumni group or a wall of fame to show all the previous interns and where they are working now and the contributions they've made. So that's something we want to try and roll out on our website soon. And then the next R in terms of rewards, like we try and reward our students by, you know, using the mentor stipend that Google provides to each organization. So Google will provide $500 for each mentor or each project you have. So last year for us that was about $6,000. And so we try and pay it forward by using that money to sponsor the travel of students. And so last year, we sponsored the travel of our students to a number of different open source events. So you can see some of the pictures here that they've gone to. One of our students who was in Texas already, he went to OSCON. A number went to the Google Solve for India conference. Some went to the Google Developer Day for India. Uh, we also sponsored a tech summit at one of the universities our students graduated from. And then we also had a couple students attend FOSS Asia recently. And we also use the travel stipends to help the students attend, or well, Google provides the travel stipends to directly attend the events, but it is a big motivating factor for them to be able to either go to the Mentor Summit in Mountain View or to go to the Google Grand Prize trip in San Francisco. And these are just a few of like the blog posts and ruminations that our students have shared when they've been able to do that. And then lastly, when we have global or regional events for MIFOS, we get our students to attend those as well. So these are photos from a global summit we had in Sharjah in the Emirates a couple years back. And then we also had a Tech Days in Amsterdam. And those are a couple photos of Ishan and Gaurav with one of their mentors, Ashok. And then the fourth R was recommendations. And so the power of a recommendation on LinkedIn or other platforms goes a long way. So I think I've you know, recommended at least half a dozen of our students on LinkedIn. And that's really for valuable for them as they go on in their individual career pursuits. And then the last R of the five was referrals. So it's really powerful for us to not only provide a recommendation via LinkedIn, but for us we have a pretty vibrant uh, fintech ecosystem that's working on top of our platform. So several of our students have gone on to work at a number of the companies in our community. So Rajan, he's worked at both Rupai and IDT Labs. So Rupai is a digital credit startup in India and he's worked remotely for IDT Labs, which works in Sierra Leone. Nikhil has also been working in Sierra Leone for IDT Labs. And then Kumaranath from India, he's been working for one of our partners in Myanmar called Titsaworks. And then Ishan worked a little while at Missoni in Amsterdam. 
And then Avik, he's been working for one of our partners on their FinFlux solution and then moved to a pretty big FinTech company, Novopay, as well. So for us, it's a big incentive and it's valuable to have these folks that have experience and knowledge already to be able to work professionally and begin their careers in our ecosystem. And then this is the bonus uh, sixth R, just like reunions. But it, on reunions, I really want to talk about the connections both online and in person. But we always try and you know, make sure when other students are in an area that they, there are other students for them to connect and reunite. So here are some of the students coming together in Mumbai. I'm not sure where the center photo is. And then this was at a developer conference in Delhi. And so it's really important for us to stay connected, you know, not only face to face when those meetings can happen, but also really just to stay connected online, like being in touch with the students, knowing what's going on with them so we can understand what their passions are, what their current interests are, and continue to show them how we can, you know, keep them involved. And just in terms of the after, I think it's nice to, you know, look at a couple of our students and the journey they've gone on starting with Summer of Code. So you've seen Garav on a number of the slides, but he started out as an intern in 2013. And then he went on to become a mentor every year since then. We didn't participate in, in 2015. Oh, he actually was a 2014 intern, sorry. And then he also was a mentor and org admin for Google Coden. He became not only a committer to our Apache project, but also a member of the project management leadership committee. He's the maintainer of the web app, as I noted before. He's attended several of our conferences, as well as ApacheCon. And then he's also worked for some of our partners, Conflux, as well as Quaylap. And he's also now a published author on hybrid app development. And then Rajan was a 2016 intern. He was a 2017 intern on the Apache side. And then he's serving as a mentor for us this year. He was a mentor and ag org admin for Google Code in the past two years. He recently became an Apache FinRAC committer as well. And then he helps to maintain several of our mobile apps. He's attended a number of the Google events they've hosted. And as noted earlier, he's worked for a couple members of our ecosystem. What's Apache uh, So that's the name of when we moved MIFOSX into Apache, it took the name Apache FinRAC. So. so just to touch on a few of the challenges that we've seen over the years. So first off, the selection process is very competitive. One year we had 115 like actual applications and only seven slots, so it was difficult to select among students. And usually we see most of our applications on the mobile app side, so typically we have to be really selective there, so sometimes have to turn away good students. And then scoping out the projects, just making sure they have a solid list of requirements does take a fair amount of time. As I said earlier, you know, don't be afraid to fail the students. It's healthy, it's a sign of a good community, and it's needed to help the student learn and help the organization grow. The no one to call it quits is more about, because sometimes we've had projects that was worked on one summer, we've had another student work on it another, another summer, and then sometimes we just have to recognize it might be a project that's not a good fit for Summer of Code, or there are other you know, blockers or dependencies, so you know, pull that from our list of ideas. And then lastly, going back to your point about you know, maintaining and shipping the code, last year was pretty difficult for us to ship a lot of the code that was created. We we're only just like, you know, in the past couple months getting around to shipping some of the code that was worked on because we had to go through a lot of QA and then with some of the transitions we had with maintainers on the Apache side, it took a while to get that code shipped, but we still you know, want to make sure it's all out there. And then to close, you know, just some of the takeaways. I've got 13 of them here. So first off, you know, it starts by having good, committed, and empathetic mentors. As I said earlier, you want to search for and seek out passion and potential and not just go for the initial professional experience. We really have to see that engagement early on in the application period. And then you want the students to communicate and commit early and often. Don't be afraid to fail. I want to you know, emphasize that again. It's been an important lesson for us and a hard one for me. Uh, really make the interns feel like they belong in the community. Immer <laughs> immerse them in the community so they feel like they are a deep part of it and know where they fit in. Show them that pathway to their potential and what's the long-term role they have. You know, give them ownership of the code. Give them ownership and leadership in the community. Those shout outs via social media really go a long way. You know, stay in touch both in person and virtually so you can be connected about their needs. The rewards can come in many forms, like we've used it to provide travel and sponsorship. And then lastly, you know, recognize them, recommend them, and refer them. And I think we're pretty close to the time, but if you have any questions, then there's my contact information there. So. Is that failure like getting fired in the middle of the project? 
So, so Google now has three evaluation periods. So it can happen during the first one, the second one, or the last one. And so for us, it's, we've waited to the last evaluation period to fail the two students we've failed. But we had the red flags visible in the first evaluation period. And we should have probably you know, acted at that time. And I think others who've been in Google, Google Summer of Code can probably attest to the same, too. So. Maybe just they know what they're doing. Uh, well, these two, team goes no, these two students, they were edge cases. One, was, one didn't reveal, or we didn't learn until the end of the summer that they had another internship. And that was why they weren't as productive during the first part. They stepped up their level of productivity by the end, but we still failed them. And then the other one. He had like disputes about, you know, we didn't have the right mentor, so we shifted mentors midway through the project, but he never responded to the feedback. I mean, he started to a little bit at the end, but he yeah, no, didn't complete the project and also wasn't growing like we wanted to see him grow. So it wasn't the case of, yeah, someone disappearing, nothing clear cut like that. So any other questions? Okay, well, thanks, everybody. I think they recorded the session, and then I can send out the slides too. So, so, the, so the kids don't get paid though. So if they if they get failed, they get I think and correct me, Michael. So if they make it through.